iPhone 14, Apple Watch Ultra, AirPods 2. That's old news, man. Expand your horizon. Look to the future. The rumor mill has not stopped about the things yet to come, and it's looking all but certain that we will get our fourth October event of the last five years. After all, Apple has promised us a few things by year's end. Do you remember what those promises are? If you don't, we'll get into it. But first, let's chat about the thing that is most frequently seen refreshed in October, the iPad. So Mark Gurman, who's the Bloomberg reporter that holds a chart-topping 87% leak accuracy, according to Apple Track, says that we can expect a pretty boring iPad Pro refresh this year. And I mean boring. Now, the tablet is slated to inherit the new M2 processor that was introduced on the MacBook Air a few months ago. But beyond that, the changes are few. And it's like, okay, cool, because the last thing that the iPad Pro is is underpowered, but I digress. Where are our Pro apps? Gurman and reliable analysts Ross Young and Ming-Chi Kuo, they all agree that the 11-inch iPad Pro, the smaller model, will not inherit the mini LED tech that the bigger model got last year, despite early rumors to the contrary. Kuo even goes so far as to say that Apple will never put their mini LED tech into smaller displays, and that Apple's groundwork on mini LED will be exclusive to laptops and desktop displays going forward. So then what gives? Well, the ELEC, which has an admittedly spotty track record, suggests that the iPad Pro is waiting to move to a hybrid OLED display. But things aren't ready. That'll happen in 2023 or 2024. What is a hybrid OLED, you ask? Well, I have the same question. Your smartphone almost certainly has a flexible, plastic-backed OLED panel. They are lighter, they are thinner, more shatter-resistant, and, well, more flexible than the rigid AMOLEDs of the 2010s. But their lack of rigidity can cause a wrinkling effect. Now, this isn't very noticeable on small smartphone displays where we typically see OLEDs, or on large televisions that you're sitting perfectly perpendicular to a dozen plus feet away. But Apple has reportedly been very unhappy with the way that flexible OLEDs look on mid-sized displays, like laptops and tablets. So a new hybridized design using ultra-thin glass as a substrate rather than polyamide is being developed by both LG and Samsung, and it's expected to be ready for production within two years. So it's at that point that we might see the iPad Pro line reach display parity on both sizes when they switch to OLED. So will anything be new this year beyond the M2 SoC? Maybe. A wacky rumor from Mac Odakara has recently cited supply chain leaks indicating two new four pin connectors at the top and bottom of the iPad. Their purpose? To, and this is translated from Japanese, quote, be a terminal to assist in powering peripherals that connect to the Thunderbolt port on the iPad. End quote. This makes absolutely no sense. Thunderbolt supports 100 watts of power delivery, which is enormous. So if this four pin connector is real, there's gotta be another reason for it because it's not that. <laughs> Personally, I find the rumor that Apple will be placing the iPhone's flavor of MagSafe behind the glass Apple logo on the device's rear to be more likely. But even that seems kinda meh. Partially because of how unstable the behemoth iPad would be balanced on that tiny little puck and because of all the incompatibility that there would be with hopefully backwards compatible keyboard cases. And let's not forget that the iPhone MagSafe is limited to 18 watts of charging speed versus the iPad Pro's uh, current 36 watt max speed over USB-C. So yeah, who knows on the iPad Pro? Boring? Probably. What isn't likely to be boring is the new base model iPad. Apple's cheapest tablet is expected to get its first form factor change in a decade, if my smart price is to be believed. Now, the outlet has only had about five leaks total in the last two years, but they have all been dead on. So I put a fair bit of weight in this. They are reporting that the new iPad will adopt the flat sides and the camera hump of the Air and Pro siblings, while retaining some of the old form factors, specifically the Touch ID button found on old iPads of yore. Now, Mac Otakara disagrees. They say that they are going all screen with the new iPad and that they will be adopting a Touch ID power button like on the Air. But at that point, what's the point of the Air? I just, I don't buy this. And I expect that it will be more in line with what my smart price has alleged, home button and all. 
There also doesn't seem to be consensus about Lightning versus USB-C. Given the new iPhones and AirPods Pro, it's clear that Apple isn't quite done with the shamefully outdated connector. But there is a reason that I am voting and hoping for USB-C on the base model iPad. Not only would it bring parity to the iPad lineup and permit external device usage via the Files app without having to use that hokey camera kit adapter, but it also means that the original Apple Pencil can finally die. Reducing SKUs is always nice, and I hope that this is their move. The tablet is also expected to get the 2020 A14 Bionic, if Mark Gurman is to be believed, and frankly, I think that makes sense. The A14 is the chip upon which the M1 is built, so it's in remarkably high supply, but it still segments it from the more expensive M1-capable iPad Air. There are also rumors of the base model iPad inheriting 5G support, which sounds great, but it does cause me to worry slightly. The entry-level iPad's greatest asset has always been its price. At $329, I don't think there's a better value in the entirety of Apple's product portfolio. And I hope that all of these new features don't put it out of reach for its intended audience, like the education market and casual consumers. Which reminds me, it's about time you educated yourself about cooking so you can move from casual to pro with today's sponsor, HelloFresh. This time of year is busy, and cooking dinner should not be your primary worry. HelloFresh sends pre-portioned ingredients right to your door. I have spent a whole lot less time prepping, and my food waste has dropped down dramatically. HelloFresh is up to 72% cheaper than dining out, and it's a lot healthier, with options that fit any diet, like my wife Megan's gluten allergy. You can swap proteins and sides and make meals your own. We've been eating more meals together, we've been eating healthier, and it shows. Sticking to your goals without sacrificing flavor has never been easier, and with more than 30 recipes to choose from every week, you're never gonna find yourself with repeats. Look, I'm a pretty good cook, I'm definitely a snobby one. We've tried all of the meal kits, and we find that HelloFresh is the most consistent and genuinely delicious, with zero alterations required. And look, if you're not a good cook, Good news, because their step-by-step -step instructions make it almost impossible to screw up. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code SNAZZYLABS16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free surprise gifts. It's literally free food. What more could you want? Thank you to HelloFresh, and thanks to you for supporting Snazzy Labs. Now, before we get to the Mac, let's talk about some smaller stuff that we may see before year's end, but probably won't see at the October event. First up, we've got the rumored model J255 Apple TV. Now, you'll recall the Apple TV got an update just last year. It received a new remote, but the device only received a dated A12 SoC bump. Now, for its intended use as a TV media player, that's not such a big deal. But if the idea that Apple has is to streamline production, and it really seems to be, the Apple TV may just get the bump to the A14 Bionic, like the entry-level iPad. Gurman states that this change will also be accompanied by an extra gig of RAM over what the Apple TV ships with today, which is three gigs. This could help the Apple TV with Apple Arcade titles, which, if you don't know, are required to support all of Apple's platforms, TV included. On the subject of gaming, we might see yet another change to the remote. An increasing number of Apple TV games just straight up require a gamepad. But a large majority of the catalog still supports the old Apple TV remote. That remote had a gyroscope built in, and that's not found in the new Siri remote. On my Apple TV, I literally don't play games because I, I don't have a controller to do it. Adding a gyro to the refresh design would bring back compatibility for much of the game catalog, and including Find My support to that new refresh remote would frankly be a nice addition too. Remember the HomePod? That speaker that sounded nice but was sandbagged by Siri being garbage and with a high $350 price tag to boot? Yeah, well, it might be making a return. The HomePod Mini has sold like hotcakes, likely even surpassing Apple's wildest expectations. It has been the best-selling smart speaker, period, two quarters in a row this year. It's outsold Amazon, it's outsold Google. Incredible. Apple's market share has tripled since early last year. So both Ming-Chi Kuo and German say that Apple is returning with a Big Daddy HomePod. They've suggested that the new device will ship with a new S8 chip and will come in a size similar to the original HomePod with comparable audio performance. German also suggests that the new HomePod will have an updated display on the top with the potential for multi-touch functionality. And for that, I'd like to say, hang on just a second, okay? The original HomePod failed 
because of its price. $350 was too expensive for, you know, your run of the mill smart speaker. And so Apple lowered the price point, which they never do to $299. It was still too expensive. It wasn't selling. So if we're to believe that Apple is going to ship a device with comparable audio performance and more features several years later with all this inflation, how is Apple going to hit a price point that targets mass adoption? It can't. I think that Apple needs to target a $150 to $200 price point if they want to see high attachment rates. Now this might mean that it doesn't sound as good as the original HomePod and doesn't have that fancy pants, uh, you know, spatial room processing, but that's fine because the HomePod mini sounds horrible and it's selling like hotcakes at $100. So tack 50, $100 onto the price tag for a good speaker and Bob's your uncle, we're in business. Furthermore, last year, German alluded to the fact that Apple might be working on a HomePod with a screen. One that he said, quote, combines an Apple TV set-top box with a HomePod speaker, with a camera for video conferencing through a connected TV and other smart home functions. Now, to me, this sounds like two things, a fancy pants soundbar for your home theater with a camera and an Apple TV built in, and it also sounds like, well, just a HomePod with an iPad slapped to it. Frankly, I think both of these things should exist. Imagine a nice eARC soundbar with an Apple TV built in, support for HDMI CEC, for everything else connected to your TV, etc. Oh, look, Steve Jobs always wanted to make a TV. Apple was working on it. And this could be that without actually making and selling the TV. More exciting though, in my opinion, is the idea of an Echo Show competitor. Imagine being able to watch a show with great audio in your kitchen while you cook and have the ability to switch to a FaceTime call without having to do a thing. Or imagine a fancy photo frame for grandma where the entire family can upload photos right from their phone to an iCloud shared photo library that will appear in her house without you having to do anything. A device where you could control your entire smart home and see your phone notifications at a glance. Ugh. I want one, it sounds amazing. But rumors of such a device have decreased over time, not increased. So we're probably just going to get another simpler basic HomePod. All right, let's talk the Mac. Right now, the most likely to be seen at an October event is a plop and drop version of the Mac Mini. Now, rumors of a redesigned Mac Mini, they have all but died since the Mac Studio was released. And honestly, fair. We demonstrated that Apple could shrink the form factor earlier this year, but most clients buying that machine, they're in education and enterprise, and they actually actively don't want a form factor change. Besides, if they keep the larger design that they've got right now, they could have additional thermal headroom for both M2 and M2 Pro models. Remember, the Mac Studio, it starts with a Max configuration, so there is a hole in the market on the desktop side that the Mac Mini could fill. So let's talk chips for a second because rumors are all over the place. The M1 and the M2, they're both very similar chips. They're both effectively based on the A14. Both the M1 and the M2 run the same five nanometer process size, process iteration be darned. And the M3, the new big daddy, that's slated to be based on TSMC's brand spanking new third nanometer process. And Apple is first in line for those chips. So first in line, in fact, that AMD was so pissed off that they defected to Samsung's fab. Apple has bought up almost all of TSMC's supply for the first year. In a TSMC recent earnings call, they issued high half one 2023 revenue guidance and directly stated that three nanometer was the reason for that. So Apple will start buying millions of three nanometer chips in the next few months. So then what becomes of M2? Cause it just came out. Well, rumors are literally all over the place, completely contradictory and they're changing by the week. So I am going to make my own predictions. So I suspect that come October, we'll see both a new Mac mini and refreshed MacBook Pros. Now the former will come offered with the M2 and M2 Pro and the laptops, well, they're gonna get the M2 Pro and M2 Max just as they did last year. These chips should be frankly pretty easy to produce because they're very similar in production and design to the M1 Pro and M1 Max. I'm also going to predict against the green, I might add, that we will see a refreshed Mac Pro offering the M2 Ultra and M2 Extreme this year. Now the M2 Extreme will be the Jade 4C chiplet design that's been rumored for over two years. It'll just be based on M2. It'll be a huge chip physically at around 600 millimeters squared. And it'll be hot with maximum power consumption of around 600 watts. It'll be bloody friggin' fast. So then the logical question becomes, well, if the M3 is on a new process size that can achieve a much higher transistor density and in a lower power envelope, 
why would Apple not hold the Mac Pro until early next year? Well, I think that there's two reasons. Number one, Apple said that the transition would be completed in two years, nearly two years ago. The clock has run out. And while it wouldn't be the first time Apple has broken promises, it's not typical. Tim Cook's roadmaps are pretty locked tight, and the Mac Pro has been expected, ready to ship for several months now. Reason number two is that chip yields are a real issue in early production, and it's not typically until later in the production cycle that the high bin chips become dependably available. Now, considering the scale at which TSMC will be making these chips for Apple and the comparably low volume of Mac Pro sales that there are may well mean that Apple could feasibly hold off on a Mac Pro until M3, but I wouldn't expect them uh, to because, uh, frankly, they've demonstrated thus far that they start at the entry level and work up, and I, I think that they'll continue that. Now, there are a lot of rumors for the M3. German says that next year, we're going to see a new 15-inch MacBook Air, potentially the return of an ultralight 12-inch MacBook. Please be true, please be true, please be true. <sighs> that sounds amazing. We're expected to get a pro-level iMac and a refreshed Mac Studio. If all of that is true, I think that it would be late 2023 or early 2024 before Apple was ready to release an M3-based Mac Pro. So I think they're just gonna do it now. But let's say, potentially, that's not true. That leaves us a decent iPad refresh, a boring iPad Pro, boring MacBook Pro updates, maybe a new Apple TV, big whoop. I mean, is that it? Is that worthy of a keynote? Probably not, which is why we might just not get one. All of these updates are frankly, in my opinion, press release worthy. And after all, Apple has only held an October event three of the last five years. So then maybe our next keynote just comes in January. January? <laughs> There's never keynotes in January. You're right. There hasn't been January events since 2010 when Steve Jobs announced the iPad. But Ming-Chi Kuo says, quote, Apple ARMR will likely be announced in January, 2023. That's a pretty declarative statement from a pretty uh, trustworthy leaker. German has also suggested that Apple's long-awaited VR, AR, mixed reality headset will launch in the first half of next year. So then what the frick is it, okay? We have no idea. And that's what, in my opinion, makes it so fascinating. Normally, we see leaks out of the wazoo for stuff like this, but there has been so little that we were basically just throwing darts at a wall with a blindfold on. But here's what we do know. No. Apple is working on three new headsets, N301, N602, and N421. Now the first headset, N301, that's expected to be called Apple Reality Pro. <laughs> Apple just filed trademarks for a bunch of reality-related names a couple of weeks ago under one of their shell companies in a bunch of countries. Now, this device has been in development for years and is expected to blend augmented reality with virtual reality, AKA that's called mixed reality. <laughs> it's expected to run two processors, an M2 SOC designed to handle primary operations, and then a coprocessor designed for sensor-related operations. The device is expected to be a standalone device, operable without an iPhone or anything else, and it will have more than a dozen sensors and cameras around the device to track hand movements and gestures, potentially including eye tracking. And it's expected to run a fork of iOS called ROS or Reality OS. Rumors are suggesting, as you might expect, a very high retail price, like get ready, potentially over $2,000 to start. And that's in part due to the fact that, well, it's Apple, but also because they're rumored to be using brand new micro OLED display technology and extremely expensive low distortion optical pancake lenses at a unit cost to Apple of about $40 each. That's insane. By contrast, the Fresnel lenses that are found in, say, the Valve Index, those have an estimated unit cost of about $4. If this newfangled device is successful, it's expected that a lower-end model will launch in 2024 to a more budget-conscious, broader market. This is just so bizarre to me because nobody has made AR cool, including Apple. And frankly, no one's really made it even useful outside of very niche industrial applications. And in the VR world, well, its exclusive use pretty much has been gaming. So to imagine that Apple wants to create a hybrid system, but one that leans more on head-mounted existing goggle-based VR tech than something like, say, Google Glass, is both fascinating and perplexing. But if anyone can pull off ushering this tech into the mainstream, it's Apple. That said, <laughs> boy, am I still super skeptical. 
So while the end of 2022 may seem a bit boring, it seems that 2023 has some absolute insanity from start to finish. You can bet that we will be covering and reviewing everything here, including the recently released iPhone, Watch Ultra, and AirPods Pro 2. So get subscribed and enable notifications so that you don't miss anything. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy.